Welcome to this video session on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is the second in a series of lessons on muscular dystrophy. In the first session, we talked about the general pathophysiology of the family of diseases known as the muscular dystrophies. In this second session, we look at the most extensively studied and the best understood of these conditions, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and consider the genetics behind this sex-linked disease, the clinical progression of the disease, and current treatment options. In the previous session, we looked at the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex and discussed how mutations to proteins within this complex can lead to membrane instability and the degeneration associated with muscular dystrophy. We now consider mutations to specific proteins within this complex. We'll begin with the most commonly affected and best studied of these proteins, dystrophin itself. This 427 kilodalton protein is the product of one of the largest gene sequences in the human genome. The end terminus of the protein is found bound to the actin filaments extending from the myofilaments just under the surface of the membrane. A flexible rod region extends to the undersurface of the sarcolemma and provides a degree of flexibility between the contractile elements and the anchoring complex. A cysteine-rich domain binds to beta-dystroglycan, among a number of other transmembrane proteins, to anchor the contractile apparatus to the membrane. The C-terminus binds a number of additional proteins thought to be involved in signal transduction. The earliest studies of Duchenne muscular dystrophy identified its selectiveness for male individuals. Currently, 1 in 3,500 to 5,000 full-term male infants are eventually diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This led to the classification of a sex-linked inheritance pattern. Sure enough, with the evolution of the field of genetics and characterization of X and Y chromosomes, the dystrophin gene was localized to locus XP21, about midway along the short arm of the X chromosome. A quick review of X-linked inheritance patterns. An individual with an XX genotype will carry two functional copies of the genes found on the X chromosome in each of their cells. Those with an XY genotype, on the other hand, will host a unique set of genes specific to the Y chromosome that are not found in individuals with an XX genotype. This comes at the expense of having only a single copy of genes associated with the X chromosome which includes the dystrophin protein. A single functional copy of the dystrophin gene is sufficient for normal expression of the protein. But while XX individuals have two copies to inherit a working copy of the gene, XY individuals are dependent on the one inherited copy. This is the reason why the disease is almost exclusively seen in XY individuals. The Y chromosome is always inherited paternally meaning the defective gene is inherited maternally from a carrier of the trait. This is the situation in two-thirds of the cases of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, with de novo mutations accounting for the remaining third of cases. For this reason, when a case of DMD is identified, genetic testing is recommended to determine the maternal genotype. In instances where the mother is found to be a carrier of the condition, genetic counseling is recommended to educate the parents regarding further conception outcomes. For any male child, there will be a 50% chance that the child will inherit the condition and a 50% chance of inheriting the normal allele. For any female child, there will be a 50% probability that the child will be a carrier of the condition, having inherited the affected allele maternally and a normal allele paternally. The remaining probability is that the child will inherit two normal alleles. The clinical presentation of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is primarily dictated by muscle fiber necrosis. Consequently, there are few clinical signs of the condition in the first three years of life. Infants demonstrate normal strength and are within normal ranges for achieving motor milestones. Dystrophin has been identified in other body tissues, including neural tissue. As a result, some mild cognitive impairments may be present, but this is an inconsistent finding. There is some degree of variability in the onset and rate of progression of signs and symptoms, but all follow a similar natural history. Initial signs of muscle weakness start appearing in preschool children, around three to four years of age. 
This typically begins as frequent stumbles and falls as the child has difficulty picking up their feet due to developing weakness in leg musculature. Despite this weakening, patients typically notice a paradoxical enlargement in these muscle groups, in particular with the calves. This is because of infiltration and thickening of connective tissue within the muscle, rather than true muscle fiber hypertrophy. This phenomenon is referred to as pseudo-hypertrophy. As the child ages, progressive weakness will start to have an effect on normal activities of daily living. The child begins to struggle with activities that require more forceful muscle contraction, such as rolling over, rising from a lying position, and climbing stairs. In school-age children, the ability to jump and run is lost, as the child loses the ability to forcefully push off from the ground. Over time, the child develops a waddling gait pattern similar to Trendelenburg's sign as the gluteal musculature weakens. Weakening of spinal muscles leads to both scoliosis and lordosis, and the child may develop a toe-walking pattern to avoid falling backwards. As weakness progresses, patients will develop characteristic strategies to compensate for strength loss. For example, a common strategy has been observed to transition from a lying to standing position and is referred to as Gower's sign. Starting from a supine position, patients will roll to a prone position and transition to their hands and knees. Using their hands to stabilize their base, the patient will transition from knees to feet one leg at a time. From here, the patient will either move their feet forward or their hands backwards to bring their hands and feet closer together, then walk their hands up their legs to establish a standing position. At some point, the school-age child loses the ability to ambulate independently and becomes restricted to a motorized wheelchair. The precise age at which this happens is highly variable and dependent on a number of independent factors working together. Deformities will also become more apparent in this population. There is also a noticeable decline in upper body function at this point. The upper limbs are not recruited as often for generating forceful contractions, so the rate of muscle damage and degeneration lags behind what is seen in the legs. In addition, most upper limb activities require minimal force and are not compromised until a greater proportion of muscle is affected. By the time of early adolescence, however, the child will struggle to bring their arms over their head or out to their side. Upper limb weakness will continue to progress and by late adolescence the patient will be unable to lift their arms to their face and limited to intrinsic hand movements. Core musculature becomes increasingly affected in late adolescence, including muscles of respiration. Respiratory therapists assist with the clearing of phlegm from the respiratory tract as coughing becomes increasingly difficult. Older patients will also be equipped with CPAP machines to assist with breathing at night. As the disease progresses towards end stage, respiratory function will continue to diminish, leading to a reduced vital capacity. The patient ultimately succumbs to respiratory failure, which is usually precipitated by some sort of respiratory infection that compromises gas exchange beyond what the patient can handle. At present, there is no cure for the disease. Average life expectancy is currently 26 years of age although some patients have been known to live well into their 30s with proper management. Genetic testing can be useful to identify carriers where a family history of DMD exists. In known carriers of the trait, in utero or neonatal testing can be performed to determine the genetic status for the fetus. In cases where prior genetic testing has not been performed, parents will typically seek medical attention when the child demonstrates early signs and symptoms of muscle weakness. Suspected cases of muscular dystrophy are initially referred for blood work. The focus is on creatine kinase, an enzyme specific to muscle tissue that appears elevated in the blood following muscle damage. A CK can become elevated because of damage unrelated to muscular dystrophy, a series of three consecutive positive tests a month apart from one another is required for a positive diagnosis of muscular dystrophy. Ultrasound can also demonstrate increased echogenicity in weakened muscles due to increased fibrosis and edema. When initial positive tests are confirmed, patients are typically referred for more extensive genetic testing to determine the precise form of gene mutation. Echocardiography is also warranted, 
as the loss of dystrophin will also have an impact on cardiac muscle. Prior to the development of advanced genetic testing, muscle biopsy served as the gold standard for differential diagnosis. Samples are typically taken from the vastus lateralis due to the ease of access. There are few necrotic cells early on in the disease process. At this stage, the most notable findings are a large variability in muscle fiber size with small rounded or triangular shaped muscle fibers interspersed between much larger fibers. There are also focal regions of regeneration as distinguished through the appearance of centralized nuclei. As the disease progresses, necrotic fibers will appear in increasing proportions. Towards the end phase of the disease, the muscle is almost completely fibrotic, with only a small portion of living fibers remaining. As a result, the limbs become progressively frozen in positions of contracture with limited range of motion. At the present moment, there is no cure for muscular dystrophy, but research is ongoing, with promising advances in the area of gene therapy. Current treatment focuses on limiting morbidity and preserving normal function for as long as possible. Low-impact exercises and stretching routines help to maintain muscle function and minimize contracture. Patients are also closely monitored for comorbidities, such as bed sores and respiratory infections. Occupational therapists can continually develop and modify orthotic devices and the home environment to allow the patient to maintain a high level of independence for as long as possible. That concludes this second segment on muscular dystrophies. In the next session, we will pick up with a discussion of Becker muscular dystrophy, which has a similar pathophysiology to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, probably because it affects the exact same gene. We'll discuss how different mutations to a single gene can result in a different form of the disease and compare and contrast these two disease conditions.